All right, so we're going to look at another aspect of uh, electronegativity, uh, which is the pull uh, of one atom on electrons from another atom. Right? And we're going to uh, look at, in particular, uh, ionic bonds. So ionic bonds are going to be our topic. So in the last lecture, we looked at the most... Um, Straightforward type of covalent bond, which would be the nonpolar covalent bond where they equally share. Now we look at ionic bonds. I'm going to kind of come back to the polar because it's going to be, you'll see, you'll see when it's all done, how, to, how they kind of fit together, how there's a relationship. And then finally, the, the hydrogen bonds. So right now we have two, two elements up here. Um, this over here has 11 protons in it. So by definition, the number 11 for protons defines the element. So if you wanted to find out what element is this, we'd look at the periodic table and find out which one is number 11, and that, and that would be sodium. Okay, so this is sodium, or Na, and that's going to be an important element for us um, because um, sodium ions, because we're talking about ions now, we're going to get into this, um, they are going to be important in balancing uh, charges uh, across membranes within cells. Uh, so the sodium ions are going to be important. Proteins that move ions across membranes uh, are going to be moving a lot of sodium ions. Now, you might notice that for a lot of the elements, hydrogen, H, carbon, C, oxygen, O, but sodium, N, A, uh, it's because the S was already been taken, sulfur, and some others. So Na, natrium uh, is a Latin Latin word for, uh, for sodium. So... Um, Sodium has 11 protons. So we put two in the first. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That fills up a second shell, right? Now there's eight. But 11. There's one more electron. So we actually have to go now out into the third shell. Let's go a little further out. But out in that third shell, there's one electron. One electron out of eight electrons max. So it, need, it needs seven more. It needs seven to fill that shell. That's kind of a lot to ask for. Um, but that's what we have. That's the situation there. Here, 17 protons. So we look at the periodic table. You'll find 17 is for chlorine. Chlorine itself is going to be important in the formation of salts. We're not going to focus much on chlorine uh, itself, though, really. It's more, more in the uh, formation of other molecules. Um, so if we count these up, we've got two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's the first two shells full. But that's only ten. We have seven more. There's seventeen. So we we also go to a third shell for sodium, but so or sorry, but for a chlorine. But chlorine's story is different. Uh, there's seven. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. I mean, it has seven electrons out of eight electrons max. So it only needs one more. Remember we said how close they are to being full affects their pull. Right? That was one of the things. That wasn't the only thing, right? Pro protons matter. So 17 protons, that's a, that's a lot of protons. That's a lot of pull. Closer to being full, 7 out of 8, that's really close. Only one more. You need one more electron and you're full. So you would think this one has a pretty strong electronegativity. How about sodium? So I'll put the CL for chlorine over here so we don't forget it. This is chlorine. Uh, there we go. Just write that in there. Okay, so now sodium over here, well, 11, that, that's, that's a lot of protons. Um, but the outer shell, not, not good at all. One out, one out of eight. Um, so not close at all to being full. The third thing we said was the number of shells. Number of shells affected the pull. So with three shells, though, it's going to be diminished. Some other elements who have fewer protons but also fewer shells are going to be stronger than, than chlorine. Uh, we'll get to oxygen in a little bit. Uh, oxygen is going to be actually one of our, our strongest. Um, but right now, in the, in the case of these two, if we're just going to compare them and ask, who has the stronger electronegativity? Who has more pull? On electrons from the other, it's definitely going to be the chlorine. Chlorine is a really strong pull. It is so strong that what's going to happen here is something unique. The sodium, who 
only has one out of eight and would need seven more, it would actually be more stable. It would be a more stable atom if it were to lose that electron. So if chlorine, sorry, if sodium were to lose that electron, I can't erase this too well, but we can kind of get the, the basic idea. So we'll ghost it here. Kind of, you know, know, it was there, right? That one electron, it leaves sodium. Now sodium has two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It has a full outer shell. It's going to be stable. It's going to be in its actually more stable state. But there's an issue, right? We have 11 protons, 10 electrons. So now there's an imbalance. We don't have an equal number. Remember in the beginning, we talked about the elements. We said atomic number is the number of protons. It's usually the number of neutrons and electrons. In this case, now the, the electrons and protons aren't going to be the same. So this is going to form an ion. We have more protons than electrons. In this case, it's going to be called a cation because it's going to have a positive charge. Why is the charge positive? Well, more pluses than minuses. 11 pluses, right? Uh, 10 minuses, 10 electrons, right? So this is going to turn into, instead of sodium just on its own, it's sodium with a plus like that. That's called a cation. The easy way to remember is the cat, the T. It's like a plus, so that's the positively charged ion. What happens to that electron? Well... It just so happens that there's there are other elements out there who really are looking for electrons, like chlorine. Chlorine needs one more, and its pull is so strong that it can take that one electron and keep it, just hold on to it. So it's not really bonding, it's not doing anything, it's not sharing necessarily yet. All right, With this other atom, it just takes up its electron. That's going to form another ion. This is going to be called an anion. And ions a negative charged ion. So this is now going to be Cl chlorine negative. Right? So Cl negative and a positive. So now we have two different charged atoms. But in this case, we call them ions. Uh, and since they're opposite charges, they're actually going to attract each other. So what we're going to see then is a pull. This particular ion is going to pull toward this one and vice versa. All right. The pull between these two is going to be what we call an ionic bond. So an ionic bond is going to be defined as the attraction between two opposite charged ions. Right? So this one's positive over here, sodium. This one's negative right, over here. Um, let me just erase this here for a second. And that pole between the two, that is the ionic bond. Okay. Ionic bonds, you may learn in a chemistry class, are, can be very strong. They can be very strong bonds. It could be among the strongest of all the chemical bonds, that pull. What do we have here? This is NaCl, right? Or salt, sodium chloride. Try and get some table salt, which is not 100% pure, but mostly sodium chloride, and, and try to break it. Try to break apart the individual sodium and chlorine anions or anion and, and, and cation the individual elements from one another you're not going to be able to do it um, you could beat it with a hammer you could hit it with a torch it's going to take a lot of energy to actually try to rip them apart except if something else were to happen if they does salt dissolve in water it does you just add salt to water and the crystals seem to vanish they vanish because then they actually pull apart. The sodium and the chlorine actually will leave one another. So water can disrupt the ionic bonds. Water can interfere with the ionic bonds. And that's going to be something we'll get into as we talk about then the, the polar covalence. Because water is going to be a, made up of 
polar covalent bonds, which will interfere with ionic bonds. So when we talk about cells and cells have a lot of water in them, ionic bonds like this exist within cells, except they're very weak bonds. In the study of chemistry, we're typically thinking about um, these interactions without water. And without water, they're very strong. So it really depends on the situation. You can't just say ionic bonds are strong or ionic bonds are weak. Neither one of those statements really make a lot of sense unless you give it a, a context. Within a cell, the ionic bonds are going to be weak. Outside a cell, in the absence of water, ionic bonds are going to be strong. Okay, But this is an ionic bond. It's where first, really two things happen. First, you have the formation of ions. The cation, positive charge. The anion, negatively charged. And then you get the attraction or the pull between the two ions. You put them together, and that pull is what we call an ionic bond. Okay, And so we'll see some of those, mostly salts. Um, sodium chloride, uh, potassium chloride, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride. So there's going to be a number of uh, these elements calcium, sodium, that have very few electrons in the outer shell, then they tend to lose those electrons. And it tends to be chlorine almost in, in all the cases that picks them up and forms the uh, negatively charged anion. But these guys will all tend to then form the positively charged cations. So the last part of this, we're going to be um, moving into the polar covalence. That's going to be where there's going to be a sharing between electrons not stealing, but the sharing is going to be unequal. It's going to be a little bit like this and a little bit like the 